Uh, thank you so much. I hope you guys are all awake after lunch and ready for some more interactive magic. I hope it stopped raining. I know it was a little crazy. Um, so my name's Ingrid Kopp. I am director of digital initiatives at the Tribeca Film Institute in New York City. And I've been there for three years now, uh, running a lot of the interactive funds. So what I want to talk to you today is a little bit about how we work um, at Tribeca and the kinds of projects that we're looking for, because we're really looking to get interactive documentary projects from all over the world um, and some other kind of projects, which I'll tell you a little bit about um, later for the Tribeca Film Festival, which happens every April in, in New York. Um, so to begin with, the first thing I want to say is there are a lot of words to describe what we're talking about when we talk about interactive, transmedia, whatever you want to call it. And my guess is that anyone who's up on the stage and probably anyone who's in the audience, if you ask them what we mean by transmedia, they'll give you a different definition. And I think that's okay. So I tend to use all sorts of different words when I talk about this, because really, I don't care what we call it. What I'm really thinking about is stories and the kinds of stories that people want to tell and the kinds of stories that we want to listen to and be part of as audiences and as people who participate in the story universe that we all live in every single day. So, you know, for me, it's not about one platform, two platforms, three platforms. It's not about whether it's on the web or on an app or on television. All of those things are really viable. It just depends on the project and who you're trying to reach. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there straight away because um, stories are not new. Cat videos are not new. This is a, a Lumiere Brother film from 1899, just to show you that we've always loved cats on film. And stories are very, very old. We've always responded to stories. We've always created stories out of the ongoing narrative of our lives. But what is very, very exciting is what's happened now with uh, technology and with the internet in terms of connecting us globally and in terms of having this, this media that is global, ubiquitous, and basically cheap. Um, and that's what's so exciting now. That's what's allowing all of us to talk about all these things that we're talking about in terms of connecting people, in terms of having participatory storytelling, in terms of creating stories across platforms. You know, the fact that we now have these platforms is what is new. Stories have always been changed by technology. You know, cameras change, tech, um, change the kinds of stories we could tell. Non-linear editing systems like Final Cut Pro and Avid changed the kinds of stories we could tell. Sync sound fundamentally told, uh, changed how documentaries could be made when you could actually have the sound recorded as you were filming rather than afterwards. So, you know, the way technology has changed stories is also not new, um, but what is happening now is new and very, very exciting. And I hope it's something that, like, you know, everyone in this room can get super excited about as we think about the kinds of stories we want to tell. Uh, Chimamanda Ngochi Adichie, uh, a writer, says that she thinks stories are necessary, just as necessary as food and as love. It's how we make meaning of our lives. And if you haven't listened to her TED talk on the danger of a single story, I highly recommend it because it's one of the things that really drives what I do in terms of the kinds of stories that we want to fund because we're really interested in how transmedia is really allowing us to challenge the grand narrative. You know, because things aren't top down anymore. There's a lot of grassroots storytelling that's possible now. And tapping into that and allowing us to tell different kinds of stories and also to really make sure that, I, it's interesting that this morning so many people were talking about the importance of listening, because I think listening is actually a really, really hard thing to do, and it's something that some of the best storytellers are really good at. It's not, they're not constantly just trying to tell you stuff. They're actually listening to you and then responding. And because transmedia storytelling can be iterative, you know, you put a little bit out there, you get the feedback, you put a little bit more out there, you test it, you get the feedback. Um, that is a process of listening and a process of love, and I think that is um, super exciting for, for documentary filmmakers, well, for, for all filmmakers, um, but I work mostly in documentary. Um, Ken Burns, another documentary filmmaker, talks about how stories are more than the sum of their parts. With stories, one plus one can actually equal three, and I think that's something about the sort of the shamanistic quality of storytelling that never ceases to amaze me. You know, I've been working... Uh, in documentary for oh, a long time, 15 years. And, um, and I never get bored of it, and I never know what I'm going to get. 
And I think that that is, you know, what makes working in, in the creative arts and in film and in documentary and now in transmedia so exciting and, and always such an honor. But it's not just about the creators, or rather the creators are not the people that they used to be necessarily 10 years ago or, or even five years ago. And so much of what I do is really thinking about the audience. I think about the audience all the time now in my job. So I'm, I'm always looking for new talent, I'm looking for new filmmakers, I'm looking for new stories, but I'm constantly thinking about the audience. What is the audience doing? How is the audience telling stories? How is the audience talking back? What are they doing? How are they consuming things? How are they making films with their, with their smartphones? Um, how are they consuming media? People are consuming more media now than ever before, but of course they're consuming it across different devices, on their own schedules, and, and, and I think you know, paying attention to that can really give us clues as to how to recreate the kinds of stories that will capture their attentions. Because it's gone from a very passive, one-directional flow, you know, from the television to the audience, to something that's more akin to this, where the audiences are hackers and they're producers and they're making their own games and they're bloggers and they're creating websites and they're coders and they're filmmakers as well. And they also want to have a part in, in being able to tell their own stories. Um, and that's something that we're trying to create with some of the projects that we're funding, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. But, and this is a really big struggle. It's a huge struggle for traditional filmmakers who are used to a lot of control. And I think a lot of, as artists, you know, there is some, we want control. We want to be able to tell a story in the way, we want our vision to be realized. It's really hard work to make a film. It's really hard work to create any kind of interactive uh, transmedia property. So we want to have that control. And one of the really interesting things now is this battle between authorship and openness. And it's something that we're exploring in a lot of the projects that we're funding at the moment. Um, I think uh, the, this image is from Dr. Doolittle, and it's this uh, animal called a push me, pull you. So one, animal wants, one side of the animal wants to go this way, the other side of the animal wants to go that way, so the animal's like this. And I, I think that um, that's what this kind of storytelling can feel like a little bit sometimes. Um, but I think in that tension, there's a huge opportunity to tell new kinds of stories and to really open up your storytelling practice uh, to allow you to let the audience in and to recognize that the audience is no longer passive. And that can lead to really incredible collaborations. Now, this is not a new quote, and I know Clay Shirky um, gets kind of rolled out a lot when people are talking about the internet and what, how it's changed uh, the way that we produce and consume media. But I think that this is really important in this room to remember, because this is kind of amazing. And it's not that, you know, it's still only, what, 20 years old? Every time a new consumer joins the media landscape, a new producer joins as well, because the same equipment, phones and computers, that let you consume and produce, they let you consume and produce. It's as if when you bought a book, they threw in the printing press for free. That's pretty revolutionary. And when we're thinking about what that means for us, um, as both audiences and creators, I think it's really important that we don't forget just how revolutionary this is, just how much our lives have changed with the the internet and with social media and with the fact that, you know, with, with all of you holding up your, your smartphones, what that means in terms of the, the civic media public that you are now in and that you're globally connected in ways that would have been unimaginable 20 years ago. Okay, so that's my preamble. That's a long way of saying, why are we now funding this kind of work? Um, so with the TFI New Media Fund, which uh, I run at the Tribeca Film Institute, uh, we give money to non-fiction, so documentary, although we do accept hybrid projects, interactive projects that highlight issues of contemporary social justice and equality. So they have to be social issue in some way. We support four to eight projects a year, but we give them between fifty dollars to $100,000. But the money isn't the only thing. We also put them through labs, and we give them a lot of mentorship along the way to make sure that their projects get realized and that they get the help that they need. We're really um, open to projects from all over the world. It's supported by the Ford Foundation. Um, uh, and we want subject matter and teams from all over the world as well. So I really you know, invite any of you in the room who have projects that would fit this um, to apply. Uh, we are open again in March next year, March of 2014. Um, so please bear that in mind. All the details are on the website. So that's a new media fund. I'm going to show you some of the projects that we funded, but one thing I should... Um, uh, say is uh, every single project we fund is different. So just because we funded these kinds of projects doesn't mean that we wouldn't fund one of yours. 
What's really fascinating to me about this new landscape is you don't really know what you're going to get. You don't know whether it's going to be an app or a game or on the web or some you know, mixture of all the three. Sometimes there's a feature-length documentary film and then there's a story world around it. You know, so you've got the film and then you've got all this outreach. You've got the, like, the app that goes with the film. Maybe there's a Facebook game. Uh, maybe there's an interactive website. But sometimes it's just a website and we don't care. Like, all we care is that it works for the story you're trying to tell, and that it's the right platform to reach that audience. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I think Ian said this, like, you really need to know what it is that is a mark of success for your project. And it's really important to know that early on, um, so that you don't build an app for an iPad for a community that don't own iPads. That's a really simple example, but you'd be surprised how often I get iPad apps for people who would never have access to iPads. So one of the first projects that we funded in 2011 was 18 Days in Egypt. This was a project uh, that allowed people who were in Tahrir Square to tell their own stories about what they'd seen. So if they'd recorded, uh, if they'd recorded content with their iPhones, uh, or they'd taken pictures and they'd uploaded them to Flickr or Facebook or tweets, anything, they could create their own narratives um, of their experience. And this is an ongoing project. You can also invite family members and friends and people who were there with you to tell stories with you because the creators recognized that storytelling is often a communal affair, a collaborative uh, project. Um, I've put the, um, the URLs for all these projects underneath them because the other wonderful thing about this is you can go online. Most of these are available for free um, online, so you can go check them out after this. Um, so just make a, a note or just Google them and you can go have a look at them in more detail. So 18 Days in Egypt was an early project. In some ways it was wonderful, it worked really well. I think it really changed the way that people were thinking about how you could have community-based storytelling um, that was driven by creators who had uh, more of a background, more of a professional background in storytelling. And that goes back to that idea I was talking about, about the authorship and the openness and that tension. Um, you know, some things about it are tricky. Uh, if you go on the website, you'll notice there's a lot of content. So it's very hard as an audience to know what you're supposed to look at. Um, the creators never thought about an exit strategy. And this is one piece of advice that I will give you right now. Everyone thinks about how projects begin. No one thinks about how projects end. And with transmedia projects, these things can go on forever. And when you allow, uh, you know, uh, the general public to be part of your project, they might not want you to shut it down, but it means that you're going to have to pay for bandwidth, you might have to pay for community managers, all of these things. So if you are starting a project, think about how you're going to end the project and how you're going to pay for that. Um, it's not something that we often think about when we get excited, but I think it's really important. Um, Alma um, is a project from this wonderful production company in Paris, France, called Opia. Um, they did this with Arte. Um, there was a TV program that went out on Arte, and then they also created this beautiful interactive experience. Um, so you can look at it on the web. Um, it's about a, a, a former gang member from Guatemala, and it's, it's just a very close-up, very personal confession of her life in the gangs in Guatemala. And it's a two-screen experience, so you can, you can either look at her in close-up, or you can pull down and you can look at photographs and video, and the soundtrack changes. But if you do have an iPad, this is also available as a free app, and I highly recommend it on the iPad. And I think this is a re really good ex example of how different technologies and different platforms fundamentally change the experience. So even though the website and the app are basically the same, the experience on an app when you're pulling it down with your hands is so intimate that it feels very, very different. And it's, very, it's worth comparing the two, because I think it will give you really interesting ideas about user experience design and actually how fundamentally important that is. Um, Dadab Stories is another project that we uh, funded. Uh, this is uh, by an uh, organization called FilmAid. They work in refugee camps. They teach refugees to make their own films, and then they show them in the camps. Um, and um, they wanted to have a project which was um, more outward-looking, so that people who were not in the refugee camps could find out about what they were doing. And also, they wanted it to be a story about refugees that wasn't about asking for money. And it wasn't about like, how hard the life of refugees were. They really wanted to show that actually refugees often, like in Dadaab, can live there their whole lives. They can go to school. They can have businesses. One of them's a DJ. They play soccer. They cook. 
you know, they have regular lives, and they really, it was really important that they showed this, and that it wasn't always a sub story, and wasn't always about asking for money, and, and was actually giving, like I said, the danger of a single story, was showing refugees in all of their aspects. Um, and I think that this is something that transmedia or interactive storytelling can be very, very good at, because it challenges the single narrative, and it allows you to have multiple people telling stories on a, on, on a platform. Uh, this was actually built on the Tumblr platform, which is another really um, interesting aspect of it, because they knew that they wanted to tap into a community that already existed and that was younger and cooler and were into things like fashion and DJs and music. And, 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 and so Tumblr seemed like a really good place. And as soon as they set up on Tumblr, they, they had 10,000 followers within a couple of um, months. So they used an already existing platform, but what they did is they spent all their money on the design. So they reskinned Tumblr to make it look like they wanted it to look. So if you go to dadabstories.org, it doesn't look like you're on Tumblr until you scroll up. Um, and I think that's something to think about. Don't always reinvent the wheel. One of the things I get a lot is um, uh, proposals for uh, projects that are basically Facebook. It's like, we want to create a community and we want people to be able to share their stories on a timeline and upload photos. And I'm like, isn't that Facebook? It already exists. Just use Facebook. So I think that's another lesson um, is, you know, if, it, if the platform exists, use it and use the strengths of that platform. Don't reinvent the wheel. And then finally, Hollow is a project that um, just came out. Um, you need to look at it on Chrome at the moment because it's, um, it's in an early beta. Um, but this I'm incredibly proud of because I think Hollow does so many aspects of what we've all been talking about on stage today in terms of thinking about the web as a medium, thinking about user experience design, thinking about what you can do on the web that you can't do in a linear film. So there are short films that are embedded in it, but it's also this amazing interactive experience as you scroll through the life of this town in West Virginia. And it basically talks about a very, very local place um, in the United States, but it's also more globally about the concept of home, how we feel about home, what, what does home mean to all of us anywhere in the world. And that ability to take a very local story and then create something that I think people anywhere could respond to, I think is a real gift of a, a good storyteller. And I think they did it very, very well by bringing the storytelling and then the technology and the design together in this incredible package. Um, and the other really interesting aspect is they worked with local community people in the town where they were filming so that they could create their own films because it was really important to them that they weren't saying, this is how you feel. They were asking them, how do you feel? Let's share it with a wider audience. And this idea of local voice and amplification of local voice is another thing that I'm really interested in at the moment. I get really, really nervous when people say uh, they don't have a voice. Everyone has a voice. They might just not have the amplification. And there's something very demeaning about taking that voice away from people. So I think as storytellers, what we're really good at is amplifying other people's voices. Um, and uh, I think that's, again, something that interactive storytelling is particularly good at. And then linked to that is this idea of digital access. So going back to what I said about don't create iPad apps for people who don't have iPads, um, we actually, with some of our projects, are super analog. And it's really funny, um, it's come off now, but when I got here this morning, I spilled ink all over my hands and I couldn't get it off. And I thought that's such an interesting reminder of the fact that we still live in a very analog world in many ways. You know, I just had ink all over my hands, but I was sitting there with my iPad and my laptop juggled on my knees. You know, we live in a world where there's a lot of digital, but there's still a lot of analog. And don't forget the analog. Don't forget about community screenings. Don't forget about taking stuff off the web. Don't forget that an app, everything doesn't have to be locked down in an app. There is something about bringing people together into a room, that feeling of community, that feeling of talking to people face to face, which is really, really valuable. And transmedia can encompass that, right? It can encompass all these different um, aspects. And I think it's really important that we don't forget that. So with League of Nannies, this is a project where we're trying to um, let nannies and community care workers in America know about their rights because there was recently a law passed, but a lot of people don't understand that they actually have rights about how many hours they work, getting vacation, and also the employers often don't know about the rights, right? Because you're in the semi, sort of semi-legal zone where people are working at home, and so they're not often that legislated. And so what we would do is we would actually, um, they would give out these cards um, like this in playgrounds. So when they saw nannies hanging out with um, 
children, you know, that they were looking after, they would give them the card and say, if you want information about your rights, call this number. So it was very analog. It was an analog phone line. You didn't need to have access to the internet to participate in that. And I think thinking about digital access when you're thinking about your storytelling is very important as well. Um, and they created a radio show because that was another thing that they realized that people did have access to is the radio. So it was phone. It was these, these, these cards that they would hand out in person, and then it was the radio. And now they're building this nanny van, which is going to drive around, and they're going to have like, community film screenings. So all these different aspects to reach the audience that they need to reach to make the change that they need to change. So you're linking awareness, you're linking um, impact, and you're linking change together by designing a campaign really well around your media. And I think that's really important if you are creating media where you want to create change as well. And that might not be, maybe you just want to make, you want to delight people, or you want to give them an experience that makes them feel good. All of that is totally important and totally legitimate, but you need to know what that is when you start designing your project. And I think increasingly, filmmakers need to think about design. Like, design has become such an important thing, user experience design, uh, using platforms. All of this is something that we can't ignore anymore. So in addition to running the funds, what we realize is there's all this other work that we need to do to build this field, right? Everyone feels very nervous. They're like, I'm a filmmaker. I don't understand technology. I'm a technology. I don't understand how to create a story. I'm a coder. I never hang out with filmmakers. I'm a designer. I don't like coders. We don't know how to talk to each other. There's all this miscommunication because we're in a world now where it's not just film, right? It's not just film. It's not just television. We're not in these silos anymore. They're slipping into each other. And it makes us really uncomfortable. We don't even know what to call things. Hence the, is it interactive? Is it transmedia? Is it cross-platform? It's very, very slippery. And we all get very, very nervous. And the reason we get very, very nervous is because it's exciting, right? We're in a place where we don't quite know what's going to happen. And that is very, very exciting. But I think along with the excitement and along with the it's OK to be afraid, you also have to build structures to help people to realize their work. And so one of the things we've started to do is think, what else can we do beyond just a fund? Uh, so we do this thing called TFI Interactive at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, that's the hashtag. Sorry, I don't know why it ended up on my slide. This is a guy um, called Jesse Shapens who uh, created this platform called Ziga which allows you to create sort of online stories. And he came up with this web filmmaking manifesto, which he screamed on stage. So this is in the middle of him with his manifesto. Um, but TFI Interactive happens every year, and all the videos are online. So if you go to the Tribeca Film Festival, um, sorry, Tribeca Film Institute website, uh, you can see all the videos. Um, because it's very important to us that we share everything when we do it. And it's not just like for you know, six people in the room. And then the other thing we've started to do is this program called Tribeca Hacks, where we do hackathons. Now, if you are in the technology world, forgive me, because I know you probably know what a hackathon is, but in, in film, people don't. Um, so hackathons traditionally are you'll come together for three days. You'll get a bunch of guys together, usually guys. More and more, we're trying to get women in the room. Um, and you will hack an app, right? You'll make an app prototype in three days. And maybe it will be around a specific subject matter. Maybe it will be around a data set. Whatever it is, it's like you've got three days, build it. And so all the coder guys get in the corner with their laptops, and they create code. And then at the end of the three days, you present what you've done, often to funders. And ideally, those funders will then give you money to build it properly. Um, in the film world, it's a little bit different. The way we run hackathons is we bring filmmakers together with coders and designers, and we put them in a room for three days, and we tell them that they're probably going to create something pretty terrible. <laughs> But the really important thing is that they learn how to work with each other and that they understand what that process feels like. So the coders learn how to speak to the filmmakers, and the filmmakers learn how to speak to the designers. And it's a safe space. It doesn't really matter what they build. They just need to get used to that process of working together and get used to a process that's more like a sort of a startup tech process, which is more iterative, and where the, you know, the focus is really on the process and not necessarily on the product. Um, increasingly, though, we are trying to push it more towards product. So recently, we did the Storytelling Innovation Lab with the Mozilla Foundation, the guys who do the Firefox web browser. And um, we, with the help of the Ford Foundation funding, we brought everyone together for five days. And we actually helped them to build something from scratch in five days that was interactive, had a great story, and was done at the end of it. And what was really awesome is that it actually kind of worked. So I'm just going to play a very quick clip. I'm sorry, it may be a little bit muffled, but these are just people who were in the storytelling lab 
telling, talking a little bit about why, why it's important to create hackathons and help people to think about using the web as a storytelling platform. Oh, and it's not even being told. And one of the beautiful things about the internet and about computers in general is that the stories that we're told we can interact with a little bit more because you can have a lot of different layers in them uh, and you can have a lot of different components and they don't have to be linear just like life is not very linear. Because I think the web enables us to tell stories in new ways and I think that we need to learn how to make stories for the web because that's really where everything is headed. So we're looking at ways that are very new and are still formative, but we think are going to be really important in coming years for social issue documentarians, storytellers, change agents of all kinds to sort of take this and run with it. Okay, so that's very, I'm sure you couldn't hear that properly, but it's on the website as well. Every time we do a hackathon, we create a little film from the hackathon, like four minutes so that we can always say, this is what we did and this is why we did it, and you can learn from it, and maybe you want to run your own hackathon. We're going to create a toolkit, uh, so like instructions on how to run a hackathon that we're going to make available to anyone so that you can do it wherever you are with anyone. You know, you can do it with three people, you can do it with 60 people, whatever you want. But I think it's really important um, that we just start trying like, to mix this stuff up a little bit and see what comes out. And it doesn't always have to be a project that takes a year. It can be a project that takes three days. Um, and the other cool thing about this, and I think it's really important to say this, is since we are kind of at the beginning of a new phase with transmedia, I think it's really important that we get women and diversity in the room now. Because if you go to a tech conference, it's all dudes. And they're very clever dudes, but it's all guys, and it's usually all white guys. And we have to not let that happen with transmedia. So when you do a hackathon, make sure there's women in the room, and make sure that it's diverse, and make sure that you're making it as inclusive as you want your storytelling to be. That's my little soapbox. So this is one of the projects that we published at the end of our hackathon. You can check it out. Um, sorry, it's a very long URL. Um, but what was really awesome about this is that ProPublica, which is a really great um, journalism um, organization in the US, actually published it with PBS, which is the public service uh, broadcaster, at the end of the five days. Done. Um, and that for us was a really big movement where we'd actually gone from something that was really focused on process to a product that we actually delivered at the end of the hackathon. Okay, which brings us to failing. It's really important that you let yourselves fail, but if you are going to fail, make sure you fail fast and forward. So, you know, it's, I think that we have to give ourselves excuses to try things and it doesn't always work. But if you're going to do that, try not to fail too expensively and try not to take a year failing. If you can fail in a weekend, much better. If you can fail in a week, much better. But just try and make sure that every time you fail, every time something doesn't quite work, you learn from it. All right, your audience isn't on Facebook, let's try Twitter. Mm, Twitter's interesting, but we seem to be developing this here. Maybe we should use Twitter for this, but Tumblr might be better for that. Maybe we do need to build a bespoke platform because actually what we need to do is so technologically complicated that it really is worth our effort to spend three months building it. But you have to figure that stuff out and you have to listen and pay attention as you go. Otherwise, you're going to be failing slowly and backwards. Um, so finally, the, the other side of what I do now is actually showing the work, right? Because we're, we've been so focused on production that we've kind of not really been paying attention to the distribution and exhibition. And there aren't that many film festivals right now that show interactive work. So we decided, I mean, there are some, and believe me, we're definitely not the first ones to do this. IDFA, Doc Lab is incredible um, and has been doing this for five years. Um, uh, New Frontier at Sundance uh, shows interactive work. Um, but we thought it was really important that the Tribeca Film Festival um, starts to do this too, to create a space where this kind of work can be shown and where we can get audiences who come and see films at the festival to be excited about interactive work and actually be in a space together. So we created this thing called Storyscapes. And I'm telling you about this now because um, we're about to open for entries for next year, um, I think September 16th, I think. Um, and we're looking for any kind of interactive work, and I mean any kind of interactive work. We had robots. These are um, the blab droids. Um, we had a robots who made a documentary at the festival this year. Um, and it, it was an experiment to see what kind of documentary a robot would make. And these robots would ask you really, really personal questions. Um, so we'll, and we had Star Wars Uncut, which was a really awesome project where Star Wars was cut into 15-second segments, and then anyone from all over the world could reenact those segments, like with their dog 
or animation, anything, um, and we showed those segments. So we'll take anything. Um, we'll take robots. We'll take, we'll take documentaries. We'll take, it just has to be interactive in some way, um, and it has to tell a story, um, because we're really trying to create a space where we can show the work and not just talk about the work, um, which I think is very important. There's a lot of talking about transmedia, and it's really important that we show that actually there's work out there that you can go and see and talk about uh, again if you want to talk some more. Um, and this is a project by NFB Interactive. Those of you who know um, the interactive uh, space will know NFB because they do incredible, incredible work. Um, it's the National Fil Film Board of Canada. They've done things like Bear 71, the High Rise Project, um, Welcome to Pine Point, which is one of my favorite projects ever. And they did this project called uh, Journal of Insomnia uh, because apparently, I think, or oh, I'm going to forget the statistics now, three out of five people have insomnia. Um, and it's more in cities. And so we thought New York is a great place because everyone in New York is very, very stressed. Um, and you could go into this box and hear stories of people's insomnia. So it was a very immersive, interactive environment in a film festival. And then finally, um, you know, we also realized that it's important that we talk as much as possible about what we're learning. You know, like I was saying about fail fast and forward. Well, as an institute and as a fund, we've been failing fast and forward. Not all of our projects have worked. And um, when they haven't worked, they've, they've, they've failed for really interesting reasons. In fact, they haven't even failed. They've not worked in really interesting reasons, for re really interesting reasons. So we've created this, um, we call it the sandbox. Um, and it's a place where we basically have links about organizations you can get funding from, film festivals that are showing interactive work, uh, labs that you can apply to. We have all links to all the projects that we fund, to the hackathons, everything. So it's basically a one-stop shop to find out what we're doing with digital and why. Um, and we're going to be doing a new version uh, for early 2014, early next year. Um, so you can go check that out, sandbox.tribecafilminstitute.org. OK, and then this is just one final thought to leave you with. So as I start to think about the possibilities for storytelling, when you bring storytelling and technology together and you design th this new kind of story landscape, the possibilities become endless. And it's kind of overwhelming, but it's really changed the way that I think about documentary and the possibilities for documentary and the possibilities for me working in film. I mean, I can't really even say that I work in film anymore because I work across so many different kinds of storytelling mediums. Um, but I became very, very interested in stories as hardware, this idea of the internet as things and what happens when you link software to hardware. What kinds of stories can you tell? And I don't know if you are all familiar with Lance Weiler. He's been an amazing innovator in this um, field for a long time. Um, and we've actually recently funded a project of his called Lyca's Journey, or Lyca's Adventure, where this robot, this little cute robot, is going to travel around the world. And kids all around the world are going to help the robot travel by solving problems and by participating um, as the robot goes from place to place. And it's this idea of, you know, there's going to be a website but there's also going to be this physical object which actually travels around the world. And I love this idea of actually what happens when you take stories and you take software and you take hardware, you take actual objects, and you bring that all together. And I think that's something that I would really like to see more... Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to see, to see how, how that can be developed and if that is something, you know, as, um, as we increasingly, as our devices increasingly become connected, what that means for storytelling. Because I think we've only just started to tap into that. And the most boring example of that is your refrigerator talks to you. I don't want my refrigerator to talk to me. Um, but if some other thing could talk to me, I might be interested. So that's just something I just wanted to put that in your heads, because I think it's a really interesting um, development. And I think a a the technology for that is incredible right now. If you've seen those Arduinos and those Raspberry Pis, which are like that big, super cheap, um, you know, it's really easy now to create incredible um, hardware on your own with very, very, very little skills. Um, believe me, because I've done this, and I'm definitely not a the hardware person. All right, so this is uh, something that Andrew de Vigal, who used to work in Interactive at the New York Times, uh, showed once at, a, fest at a, a talk, and I was like, I'm stealing that, because I think this sums up how I sort of think about the kinds of work that I am passionate about and the kind of work that I fund um, and the reasons why I fund it. So if you tell me, I'm going to forget. If you show me, I may remember. But if you involve me, I am going to understand. 
And I think that's so important now as storytellers to think about this and what this means for your projects. We are 22 times more likely to remember a story than data or information, 22 times more likely. Stories are so fundamental to the way that we organize the world. Um, so if you can involve your, your audiences, don't just tell them, don't just push information at them, involve them in a story. The level of participation doesn't matter, it's the fact that you involve them um, and allow them to understand. All right, very quick lessons learned. Involve your audience in a meaningful way. Collaboration is hard but rewarding and often essential. Amplify local voices. Think about design and user experience. Experiment with new tools, but don't let the technology lead. Um, I think that's really important, because you can end up with a real mess if you forget about the story. Learn to love code as a creative tool. You don't need to learn to code. You just need to learn to love the fact that it can be a creative code, and you need to learn how to talk to coders. Make the web, don't just use it. Really important that we realize that we're not passive consumers, that we can actually make things on the web, and that we increasingly pay attention to policy so that the web stays open and free. Iterate, find out what works or not as early as possible. Fail fast and forward. And above all, keep creating, experimenting, and playing. And that is the end. Thank you. Gracias. Wait, I forgot the most important thing. The most important thing, I wrote it on my card. I forgot to write it on there. The most important thing is to have fun. Uh, that's what I wrote. Um, if you need to contact me, Twitter is the best way. I'm really bad with email, but I'm really good with Twitter. I'm from the hip on Twitter. And all the deadlines will be on our website, TribecaFilmInstitute.org. Thank you so much. <laughs>